have your Bible and we're going we're gonna to dive right in into Mark chapter 10. So if you want to get that out, turning to Mark chapter 10, New Testament, Jesus is here with us and it's good. Okay, so Mark chapter 10, the rich and the kingdom of God or the rich young ruler. And I know all of you are probably like, I know this story and I'm not rich, so this doesn't apply to me. No, that is not where we're at. We are going to look at at the man that came to meet Jesus, and we're going to see ourselves in him this morning, and then we're going to build from there. So in Mark chapter 10, we're going to start in verse 17. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, and he fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, which we all know, the commandments of you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. This is what the man says, teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. So what do we hear here? Hear, hear. We hear that he is a follower, He knows the rules, and he's been following the rules since a boy. So this isn't somebody who's out living, doing crazy things. No, this is somebody who's been walking the faith. And he's like, I've kept all those commandments, but what else? How many of you have walked through life and you're like, hey, I've I've done all these things that I feel like God has told me, but what else is there? Yes, anybody? You're like, I've been in the faith. Like, I've been doing this. I've been on encounter. Anybody? I've been on encounter. I've gotten rid of the addictions. I've gotten rid of these big things, these big sins that we we draw attention to in our life. I've gotten rid of those. So I'm good, right? Ah, well, what does he say? Jesus looked at him and loved him. We're in verse 21. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. Verse 22, it says, at this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. And we go on, we read, and we know, oh, it goes through the camel's eye, and we're like, man, that's challenging. How is this going to work? And we know that. Then it says in verse 27, Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible as far as giving everything up. He says, but not with God. All things are possible. Peter spoke up in verse 28. We've left everything to follow you. And Jesus replies, truly, I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters, mother, father, children, fields, or any of that for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in the present age. So, he walks away. What, I, what drew attention to me this time was in verse 22. It says, at this, the man's fell face. The man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. That I don't believe that he walked away and, he, and, God's, and Jesus is telling him, you're a sinner. Now you're going to hell. It's like, no. Jesus gave this man an invitation to what was more. And he was sad because he walked away denying that invitation. And does it mean that he was this horrible person? No, it means that he was pursuing, he was doing all the right things. And he's like, what else is there? And God goes, this right here. And he goes, no, I think I'm good. And he walks away and he is sad. So in our life, all of us can relate here. I think that if we read that, not knowing, we don't know at the end that he's going to be rich. And if it was just called the Christian, it wasn't called the rich, young, rich, young ruler or any of that. If it was just called the Christian, we'd be reading that and we're like, yeah, I've been following all these things. What's next, God? And he'd say this right here. What, what would we do? And, and he calls us in some of our lives to say, hey, Give me something, give me something, lay something down at my feet. And that might be an addiction. That might be a struggle that you've had. It might be your finances. It might be your job. It might be your expectations in life and you lay them at his feet. But it shifts at some point in our walk with God where he says, give me something to give me everything. And that moment is pivotal. And what we do at that invitation that Jesus gives him, that God gives each of us is gonna change your continence on life. 
Maybe you're feeling sad. Maybe you're feeling like, where's this joy? I'm searching for this joy. I would encourage you to look at your life and say, has God given you an invitation that you may be denied? You said, nah, not today. Or are you going to say, yeah, today is the day. I want to take advantage of that invitation that you've given me to say, I want to give you not only something, but I want to give you everything. I want to give you the rest. And so like I said, whether that's on encounter, we go there, we get rid of lust or, or sex, drugs, alcohol, addiction, these different things and greed. And we, we've not off these de- seven deadly sins in our life. We've knocked them off and we say, okay, God, what next do you have for me? Those are kind of when we're forming, we're, we're figuring out the faith, we're, we're pursuing God and we're saying, God, point these big things out in my life. But now you say, okay, um, I kind of am figuring out my life. I'm making commitments. I'm getting involved in church. I have some responsibilities. And, and what else is there? And it's really funny in talking to people and even myself. It's like, man, God, couldn't you have just fixed me all at once? <laughs> Anybody? Can you just fix me at once? But I don't think we'd be able to withstand that. I think I would be too broken to repair if God was like, let's fix it all right now. Are you ready? One, two, three. I don't think that would go well, Um, but in his graciousness and in his desire for relationship, he has said, let's do this in a process and let's walk through life together. That's why we have people who go on encounter once and they go again later, or they go on encounter, but yet now they've been in the faith for 20 years and God is still revealing things. He's still revealing things that have been there the whole 20 years, but yet why haven't you pointed that out before God? Because today is the day. Today's the day we're going to deal with that because today is the day you're ready for that. And I just think that's really powerful in his graciousness that he chooses relationship with us to point things out. So what might that be later in life? Maybe disappointment, tiredness, boredom, frustration, resentment, bitterness, anger, jealousy. So we kind of go from struggling to properly control these intense energies in our life to now even trying to access them. We have these crazy energies and we're like, ooh, let's get that lust under control. Hey, let's get, let's get that desire under control. Let's get my finances and my desire to be rich under control. Okay, but now, man, I'm just lethargic. Let's, can I just be happy about something? I'm just mad about everything. You have to access these emotions where you're like, they used to be so insane. And now I just feel numb. Anybody been through that process in life? So... That reminded me then of the prodigal son, which most of us are aware of the prodigal son, Luke 15, and um, I love it, and probably not for the reason most Christians love it. (laughs) I think a lot of us look at that, and we can relate to the younger brother, and he's there, and he's like, come on, give me the inheritance. He has greed, right? He's like, give it to me. Then he goes and he lives sexually crazy. So he has that desire for that lust, that sex. And he also walks in all of those things. So he's there. And we all love that story because the father welcomes him back with open arms. He's like, come back. You know, you didn't even think you were deserving to be my son. You've been a son the whole time. Come, I love you. But now if we look at the older brother, which is the reason I kind of like the story because anybody ever felt like the older brother? Maybe, maybe not going to raise your hand. Maybe Marsha's like, yes, thank you so much. Marsha's like, yes, that was me. Me. That is me. Because now it's like, why are you doing all that for him? I've been here the whole time. I've been living in the good faith the whole time. Neither of them actually knew the father's heart for starters, (laughs) which is sad, but there's at, in Luke 15, We've walked through it where it says, hey, father, give it to me. And now he goes out, he lives crazy, he comes back, the father accepts him. And now in verse about 25, there's the party happy and the party's happening. And the older brother who's been working in the field says, hey, what's going on in there? And they're like, they're throwing a brother, you're, they're throwing a party, your brother's back. And what does he do? It says in verse 28, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So he refused to go in. Why? Because of pride, because of all these different things. Now he's dealing with anger, bitterness, resentment. Life's not fair. So we could look at this and relate to the younger brother and say, man, I've done all these crazy things. God accepted me back. That's great. But later on in life, we say, okay, I've been doing things right for so long. Why is God showing up and healing them? I've been sick this whole time. They prayed once. I've been praying every day to be healed. And they prayed once. You have to protect yourself. You guys are like, ooh, I don't know if I like that. I know deep down inside we have maybe had those thoughts. Yes? Why is God doing that for them? Why is he not doing that for me? 
It feels icky to say, but it's true. That if you've been walking in the faith, you're like, why am I still dealing with these things? It's because God desires relationship and it's not the same for everyone. For me, um, in looking at my own life and saying, okay, God, what are you talking to me about? Okay, God, I've walked, I've walked through that. I've worked through that. And here I am yet again. And I was reminded of a conversation that I had with one of my daughters where she was irritated at one of her many sisters. And then she was irritated with another sister. And she's like, everybody is just so irritating. <laughs> and I'm like, it could be that you're just irritable. It's possible that not everybody around you is irritating. It's possible you're just irritable, that this is a you thing and not an everybody else thing. And God then that night in praying goes, <clears throat> hey, daughter, um, is it possible that you're offendable and you encounter all these people and you get offended at all these things, but is it possible it's not them, it's you, and you're just offendable? And I was like, hmm, mm, I don't think that feels good. That's offensive. <laughs> um, so you have to say, okay, God, what's going on in me? Because everything else that happens in our life just brings things out that's already there. I was like, I was never an angry person. And then I have some children and then all of a sudden I respond out of anger and I'm like, you gave me anger, how dare you? No, anger was inside of me the whole entire time. But God has placed children, has placed friends, has placed spouses in our life that brings things out. And God goes, ooh, there it is. Ooh, that's been there the whole time. Aren't you thankful they're in your life to bring that out so that I can actually deal with it now? So for me, offense. For me, pride. I mean, ouch, that's what I struggle with. These are the things. If I am being vulnerable, and that's what we're here to do today, not be vulnerable, all the men at team meeting corrected me, transparent. Sorry, men, I know you don't want to be vulnerable, but let's be transparent. Does that feel better? It means the same thing, okay? It means the same thing. So let's be transparent today, which is what have I struggled with? I've struggled with being offended. I've struggled with pride and being like, I would never struggle with that. I can't believe they're still struggling with that. That's me at my worst. And so today we look at our worst and we say, okay, what's God going to point out? Are you going to invite him to speak to you on these different things? So you go on encounter. I know I keep using encounter. What is encounter here? If you are newer, we have a, a weekend getaway, men and women, about twice a year, where we go and we get transparent and we encounter God. He shows up in mighty ways. We deal with the big deals, whether it's sexual purity, whether it's forgiveness. I'm not going to tell you all because then you won't want to go, but we deal with the big deal things in our life, the things that have been holding us down, addiction, all that. And you get through that. Now you're going through growth track. How many of you are in growth track on Wednesday nights? Powerful. Yes. He's there. He's like, I'm there. It's a powerful night. And that is to continue the growth. And God continues to point things out on that. But Ryan and I have had this conversation many times. Do you ever arrive? I always thought you arrive. Like, I'm here, man. I have conquered all of my sins now. Jesus has helped me. And I'm just living on, living on a prayer. It's great. And that is true. We do get to the place where relationship and covenant with Jesus is easier as we continually to daily choose it. But we don't actually arrive. Even when we get to the place of healing, God still says there's more. There's more. Here's something else. Let's get rid of that. And I was reminded of the Israelites. So in Deuteronomy chapter 20, they're talking about the Israelites. You're going to get to the promised land. When you get there, eat, wine, eat, drink, be happy, have a lot of wine, have some, have some bread, just enjoy yourself, right? Because you've arrived at this promise that I've given you. Ah, not quite. In Deuteronomy 20, verses 16 through 18, it says, however, in the cities of the nation, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Do not leave anything alive that breathes. Completely destroy them. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshiping their gods, and you will sin against the Lord your God. So they're arriving at this promised land. They're being obedient to God, and they arrive here. And what does God say? Kill off all that remains. 
So you say, okay, I've made these good decisions. I've arrived, I'm, making, I'm obeying God. I've arrived at where I feel like God has me. I should be good, right? And he said, nope, there's still things that you need to choose to kill in your life, to be successful in the faith. Because why? They'll pull you down. They're gonna pull you away from God, from the true God. Because you leave that one thing there. I mean, they're killing kids. This isn't just kill the men who are going to come and fight and fight back. No, kill them all because one of them, one little thing, one little child could destroy the future of your nation. If you leave a little, it's it's the whole poop in the water thing. If I told you there was one drip, would you still drink it? It's just one drip, right? We all know that. But it's true, biblically true. So... Um, I loved a couple weeks ago when um, my dad spoke on the Eucharist and, and the things that we can choose to make sacred in our life and that God makes sacred in our daily life. And one of those things is the altar. So we have the altar here. It doesn't look like um, the Bible Times altar. If I was my father preaching, I would show you a picture of the altar and I would show you the first altar and what it looked like. And we'd go back through history and I would show you why they use certain stones and it would be great. Um, but I'm not him and we don't have time for that today, but the altar is very, very important because it is where we lay things down to die and it is where fire falls. Why? Because fire falls on sacrifice and you can look at first Kings 18. I love that. I love that story with Elijah and the false prophets and kill the two bulls, put the bulls on the, and, and the fire falls. When does the fire fall? Well, after it's him alone with 900 false prophets, when it's two bulls completely cut up. Okay, now we're in the middle of a drought and a famine and let's collect 12 huge buckets of water. Where'd that come from for starters? Then they pour it all over the bowl, then fire falls. What had to happen? You had to put something on the altar for that to happen. And so altars are where sacrifices are made. And so first altar in the Bible, which we'll do a little history is done by Noah. So the flood has happened. Now they're there on dry land in Genesis 8, 20 through 21. It says, Noah built an altar to the Lord and taking some of the clean animals and birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. This is the first altar. And it says, the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. And I don't think he's talking about the rotting flesh of animals smelling real good. Like, can I have a candle that smells like that in my house? Because it smells so pleasing. Rotting animals. No, he's saying, man, that costs something. I like what's happening here. Whatever's happening in no, man, I love this. They're doing this unto me. Spiritually speaking, it's pleasing to the Lord that he did that. And so one of my favorite biblical creature, biblical creatures biblical characters is Abraham. And Abraham does four altars throughout his life. The first one is when God makes a promise to him. In Genesis 8, 20, that was Genesis 12, 6 through 7. I apologize. Genesis 12, 6 through 7. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morhat, Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So this is the first time Abraham builds an altar and he builds it based on the promise of what God has given him. Your offspring will be here and they will occupy this land. He builds two other altars, but the final altar he builds is what? Genesis 22. Genesis 22, starting at verse 9, it says, When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar. Oh, great. That's awesome. He's being obedient. He built it there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son, Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took his knife to slay his son. So the first altar he built was a thankfulness out of the promise he gave. And the fourth altar was to kill the promise that the first altar was built for. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know you, that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. 
Then if we jump down to verse 15, it says, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. First altar, thank you for this promise. It's awesome. But fourth altar, I'm gonna kill the thing that you promised me? Like God, does that really, does that really work? God knew what would happen because God is all-knowing. But did Abraham know that Abraham, did he know he himself would be willing to kill his own promise? Till that moment. I mean, he's walking up the mountain, and do you think he's saying to himself, okay, like, this doesn't really make sense. Like, I don't really know what's going to happen. But he gets up there, and he says, the Lord will provide. That's what he tells his son. But the The crazy thing is for me, I think that we look at the altar and we say, we're only going to put bad things on the altar. We're only going to put those horrible things. I'm going to make my my sin offering or all of these different things. But what if God calls us to put something we love, to put something good on the altar? Granted, he ended up not having to kill his son. He ended up being able to take that off, right? He He ended up being able to take his son off of the altar but he put him there with the full well intent that he would never leave. So we lay our promises down at his feet. We lay our things that God has said, man, I'm gonna do this for you. But would God have actually, was the obedience necessary for that promise to actually come through in the first place? That promise that he gave him at that first altar was full well knowing God knew that he'd be asking him to sacrifice his son three altars later. And so not only do we put the bad, the nitty gritty, but we have to be willing to put down his good gifts at his feet too. Because his, our obedience to his commands on our life is more important than the gifts he has given us. So, say it again. I'll say it again. It's more important. We have to obey and we have to hear from him ourselves. And this week in talking even to my daughter, one of them, um, I was like, hey, you need to do this. And she goes, I'm not going to do that. And I'm like, what? Say what? You're not going to do that? And I was like, what if I did this, this, and this, which maybe not my best parenting moment in, the, in, in, in my life. Um, what if this was the punishment? If I said, you can't this, this, she goes, I wouldn't do it. I'm not going to do it. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, all right, let's pray about this. I'm like, I got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing. Let's pray. Okay, God. And so we prayed. And she heard from God herself where God said, you need to obey your mother and your father. The rest of the story, maybe not the best, but it it happened. But there was something important. There's something pivotal in our life when we hear from God ourself. It's not somebody up here saying something. It's not your friend when you're out of coffee saying, hey, you really should figure that out. You really need to forgive that person. Hey, it looks like you've been... um, drinking a couple extra when we're out at night. Like, are you doing okay? Should we maybe look at that for a second? No, because all of that we can rationalize. All of that is, well, it's their opinion. No, but there's something different when the voice of the Lord comes and speaks to you individually about your life. And that's something that nobody can take away, that nobody can reason. Well, maybe maybe they didn't mean that. Or if they only knew, well, God is all knowing. So he knows absolutely everything. He knows every motivation. He knows every struggle. He knows every thought that it might not even look like an issue on the outside, but deep inside God's like that, that right there. And I'm reminded of um, a leader when I was growing up in church, she would always teach on encounter and she would talk about different things. And she goes, I do not eat chocolate. And I'm like, you don't eat chocolate? Like what? She goes, that's a sin for me. I'm like, oh no, this is devastating. I love chocolate. And she goes, no, God specifically told me that it had become an unhealthy thing in my life. And that if I were to eat chocolate, I'd be going against his word to me. And that would be a sin. And that was 20 years ago. And I'm still not eating chocolate because I choose to obey what he says. So is chocolate a sin for you today? I don't know. I don't know. It's something different for everyone. But I want to say that Even if you feel like you've arrived, there's something else. 
As the Israelites go to the promised land, he says, kill it all. There's still something else. Let's get rid of that. Maybe it's something awesome. Maybe God has given you this promise that you're gonna see deliverance. You're gonna speak on a stage. You're gonna do all these amazing things. You're gonna be a millionaire so you can bless other people. But has that become something that you've so focused on that now he's gonna say, I need you to lay that at my feet. We need to burn that. Fire needs to fall on that. We need to have some purification to our motivation in our life. And so um, ushers, I've handed out some things to them and they're going to hand them out to you. So if you could do that expediently, that would be great. Um, There's some in each section. There's one of these for everyone. And um, what these are is an invitation, an actual invitation to what? To the altar, ladies and gentlemen, you have been invited to the altar. And what does that look like? I think that's different for each of us. But we need to hear from God ourselves. In Jeremiah 33, it says, this is what the Lord says. He who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it, the Lord is his name. Verse three of Jeremiah 33. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. So maybe you have things in your life you know is the problem. Maybe you have things that you don't know are the problem. Maybe as I've been sharing today, something dropped into your spirit where you're like, man, I assumed nobody would ever preach a sermon on this one thing in my life. Maybe it's addiction. Maybe you're struggling with drugs. Maybe you're struggling with alcohol. Maybe you're struggling with your expectations and being let down. Maybe you have bad language. Maybe you get offended. Maybe you have questions, unanswered questions that you've been asking God, why, why, why? Maybe you just have to lay it at his feet and say, I don't need an answer. Maybe there's hobbies that have taken too much of your time, more time where you should be in the word, talking to God. Maybe your money you need to lay at the altar. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your career. Can you trust God to provide? Maybe it's your sexuality. Maybe it's sex. Maybe you have gluttony. Maybe you really struggle with food. Maybe it's chocolate. Maybe it's bitterness. Maybe you struggle with jealousy, seeing other people succeed, anger. Maybe you're just bored, lethargic. Maybe you're a sloth and you need to lay that at his feet. But maybe you um, have self-harm. I mean, if you look at 1 Kings 18, what do the false prophets of Baal do? They're self-harming, they're cutting themselves. That is not what God has for you. Maybe you need to lay that at his feet. Ask him to see yourself the way that he sees you but maybe you have to lay your promise at the altar. Fire doesn't just fall, fire falls on sacrifice. That's why the sacrifice was made with Elijah. That is why Isaac must have been placed on that altar by Abraham out of obedience. And so today your invitation is to come to the altar. And so in that invitation that you have, the invitation is for you to keep because you've been invited. It's what you do with the invitation that matters. It's not your husband's invitation or your, it's, it's yours. You specifically today, God has invited you to lay something at the altar. Like I said, this is just carpet. This is just an altar, but this is sacred because we say it's sacred because it's representing the biblical altar where they would make sacrifices unto the Lord. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Fire purifies. So maybe you don't know who this God is, that you're here today and you're like, I don't know what in the world. I, that was a lot. I struggle with everything she said awesome, you're in the right place. This is where you should be. And God has chosen you for such a time as this. And he's saying, 
lay it all down at the altar and Jesus will meet you there. You can ask Jesus into your heart and I'd happily, and our leaders would happily do that with you today. But this is an invitation to the body as a whole, to everybody here. And there's no um, guilting, there's no any of that, but there's a note card in your envelope as well. It's white, it might be down in there. And if there's not a note card, I had all of my children help stuff them, so I have extra note cards if yours did not get one. Um, But there's a note card. And what that note card is for is for you to write what you're going to put at the altar. What you need, God's purifying fire to come and incinerate in your life. It could be something bad, it could be something good, but there's things in our life that have taken the place of our priorities. And so, um, Devin, if you wanna put the buckets up here. So there's gonna be buckets up here on the altar. And it is for you to put your sacrifice in today. And if this is hard to think of something, hard to write, you're like, I don't know. Sometimes it's hard. I don't think it was easy for Abraham to put his son on the altar. And I don't think it was easy for people to go and grab buckets of water to pour on the sacrifice with Elijah. There is some cost involved. Awesome. Awesome. It's costly. But what? It says in Genesis, the aroma is pleasing to the Lord. And I want everything I do to have a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to play a song and I want to encourage you. We're going to close our eyes and we're going to ask God because sometimes we can assume, well, obviously it's this one thing in our life that we need to get rid of, but he could say, no, 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 it's actually this thing, the thing that you're not thinking about, the thing, no, I'm going to point that out. And so he is very specific with what he's going to point out. And you're like, I've never heard from God. What does that look like? Just like I do with my kids, you talk to God and you say, God, I want to hear your voice. Silence the voice of the enemy. Silence the voice of my own thoughts. I want to hear what you have to say. And when people say, I hear God, some people hear him audibly, but some people don't. It's something that comes to you that you weren't thinking about before. He can speak to you in thoughts, in feelings, in all of that. And so we're going to take a minute and I want to encourage you to ask God for yourself. God, What is it today? What invitation have you made to me to lay at the altar today? What sacrifice do I have in my life? What Canaanite do I still have remaining? Man, I have freedom, but there's still that one thing. God, I need your fire to fall on this in my life. So let's turn up the music and we're gonna do that. And if you want to write that down, you come and put it in the bucket You can walk back to your seat if you want, but I would encourage you to stay at the altar and let his fire fall on you and on your life, and then we'll rejoin. Um, But what I'm reminded of is that God is generous and he's good. And, And again, a conversation I was having with my kids, we were talking about, man, I'm just so angry, I'm so frustrated. They were really mad and they felt like injustice had been done to them and they, they were mad and they were holding on to the anger and it kept showing up in other areas of the day. And so we finally pinpointed that and I said, are you willing to give that to God? Are you willing to give him your anger and your frustration? And she was like, that doesn't seem fair. And I was like, I, I know, but that, that's, what we're, that's what we do. And so she gives it to him. And she goes, wow, that feels so good to get rid of that. And I said, yeah, I know. And she has joy on her face. And, and I said, I dare you to ask God, God, I gave you this and it cost me something. We can all say, oh, you know, it cost me something. It was anger. You don't need that anyway. But sometimes it costs to give away something, even if it's yucky. It still is hard. And she go, I said, ask God. Say, since I gave you that, that anger and that frustration, would you be willing to give me something to replace it? Would you be willing to come and fill that with something good in my life? And again, she pushes back. I don't think that's fair. Like I gave him something yucky and he's gonna give me something good. And I said, yes, because he's that good. Because he's that good. And she goes, man, I wish my sins could have died on the cross. And I said, they did. When he went and he died on the cross, he did that. Why? He took death so that you could have life. So if he can take your anger, can he give you joy? If he takes your pain, can he give you healing? And so again, we're going to ask God. We're going to say, okay, God, 
I gave you this, I put this at the altar. What comes in and fills that? And it's not an, I deserve, I deserve. The, the younger brother came back to his father and he didn't say, just give it, give me back. Give me my right standing. What good do you have for me? He came back and said, I deserve nothing. But what did the father do? Gave him a robe, gave him a party, did all of this. Was he deserving of that at all? No, but God is so good and so gracious. He gives us what we don't deserve. And so we're going to continue here just in this next couple moments. And I would encourage you to say, God, man, I gave you that. It doesn't seem, doesn't seem right that I would even say, hey, what could you come? Is there something that you could possibly give me in return? And I wasn't even planning on saying that. That wasn't even originally a part of this because I don't want it to, to come off that way. But I really felt like God laid that on my heart to say, hey, there's a grace right now in this moment to say, God, I gave this to you. What are you willing to come? Are you possibly willing to come and give me something positive, something good, something life-giving in return? We want to respond to the full invitation. Why was that young ruler so sad when he left? It's because he rejected the full invitation. He had been obedient. He had done all the right things. And he says, what more can I do? And he says, give me the rest. And he walks away and he's sad. Today, don't leave being sad. Today, leave with joy, knowing you laid it all at his feet, that you responded to the full invitation, not just a, okay, yeah, I I marked all the things, but no, I lay it all at his feet. Everything bad, everything good. God, we give it to you. We thank you that we don't have to do this on our own. We thank you that you don't leave us at the altar. You pick us up. You express gratitude for the yucky offering that we have given. And you give us something great in return. We give us our sins and you give us Jesus. How does that work? because you are good, because you are kind, because you are loving, that you are the provider. You are Jaira. You are the provider of our life in every area. We repent. We repent. We repent for areas that we've put before you. We repent for things that we've held into our God spot, whether it be our spouse, whether it be our kids. We repent of the sins and the addictions and the things that have happened. We repent of the lethargy that we've had, the things of the sloth, the just, man, I just don't even know how to get through today. No, we repent. We come humbly and say, forgive us. Please help your fire to fall on these areas of our life that we, we can't do it on our own. And that's how, that's how Jesus responds with the rich young ruler. He says, nobody can do this on their own, but with me, nothing is impossible. Those things in our life that said, man, I've been trying, I've been trying so hard to get rid of this in my life. I know it shouldn't be there. Jesus says, with me, nothing is impossible. Do not believe the lie of the enemy that says you have to fight this for the rest of your life. It can be broken in a moment in the name of Jesus. Just because it hasn't looked that way in our life, we do not base the truth of the Bible and the word of God on our reality. We base our reality on the word of God. And if it doesn't look that way in my life, I declare the word of God over my life. And I declare God that you are a provider. I declare that you are the purifying power that can get rid of anything negative in our life, any impurity, God. We lay it down. We pray right now that your fire would fall on these sacrifices that were made, that your fire would come and completely annihilate these things, that it's not, oh, I can pick them back up. No, there's literally nothing to be picked up because the fire has fallen and burned it to a crisp. You couldn't put it back together if you wanted to. God, we ask that your purifying holy fire would fall right now on every single sacrifice that has been made here today. That it might feel like, man, that wasn't a big deal. No, for a lot of you, it was a big deal and it cost you something. And God is thankful that you are willing to trust him. That you, I would encourage you that even as you leave this week, that you would say, okay, God, 
What are we gonna continue to fill these voids, these voids that have been created by the sacrifices I've been made? What, what is there that I need to do? And this is not a works gospel. And that was one of the things I didn't wanna come and be like, you have to do all these things. But sometimes God says, hey, these are some things that need to change. Here's some habits that need to change. And one of the things I love about in 1 Kings 18, where it talks about Elijah and the, the false prophets and the fire to fall, the fire fell, but it still didn't rain right away. Rain didn't immediately come. What did Elijah do? It says he went and he put his head between his knees and he prayed and he sent his servant back seven times looking, do you see a cloud? Do you see a cloud? Do you see a cloud? And where can you find Elijah? Praying on his knees. And so asking God saying, okay, God, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna keep pressing in. I'm gonna keep pressing in. I'm gonna keep praying because I believe that today you heard from God yourself. When we leave here today, somebody can't say, well, I don't know. No, you know, because you heard from God yourself today. It wasn't something Hannah said. It wasn't something that Destiny gave a point today at church. No, you heard from God for yourself. And that's something that nobody can take away. And you continue to pray and you continue to press into that.